Welcome back. For this next half hour, we're featuring the two candidates running for the Honolulu City Council District 8, which runs from Lower Iaea through Pearl City to Waipahu. Please continue to email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Our volunteers are still here. There they are. They're looking ready for some more calls. Please keep them busy. Now to our guests. Our first is Kelly Kitajiba. Kitashima, I'm sorry, I apologize, a resident of IAEA. She's a hotel executive and a 2016 Miss Hawaii United States. Next is incumbent Brandon Elefante. He is a lifelong resident of the Pearl City and IAEA communities. He chairs the, I have to say this slowly, Public Health, Safety, and Welfare Committee on the Council. Let me start with you, uh, Kitty Kitashima. Um, what made you decide to run? I know, that's a fascinating question, isn't it? You know, I, I come from a perspective of a mother. I have two kids, Kainalu and Kahiao, who are 14 and 6. And I uh, also came from the private sector. So I work in the hospitality industry, so I think I'm the only candidate here with uh, private sector experience in hospitality. And, you know, over the last decade, the framework of our community has certainly changed. and um, the dynamics has certainly changed, and as a mother, I'm genuinely concerned for the rising cost here. Um, living in Hawaii, I want to make sure that our kiki, and especially my kids, are able to return home one day. Um, increased crime, uh, the rail goes, does go directly through our district, um, small businesses have closed, and you know my heart went out, and so I felt um, coming from such a different perspective um, of a mother and someone coming from the, the private sector that I could offer um, a different option with um, some fundamentally different ideas. Councilman Elefante, are you, um, uh, what are you focusing on in this campaign? What are people telling you that they want to see uh, improved? So what I've been hearing going door to door, and thank you for having us, Daryl, and to PBS as well, and to the viewers, um, what I've been hearing is multiple things like infrastructure, sustainability, homelessness, transportation. Those are key critical things. Um, housing is a, another big issue, and having the affordable housing costs uh, in the community. And infrastructure can also include our parks as well. You know, we really need to pay close attention to a lot of that. Um, we're an aging community as well, and we also have a lot of newcomers to our community as well where people are just getting started with their families or maybe millennials buying their home for the first time so it's integrating all that and then also making sure that we integrate that with rail that's already in our community and not online just yet you know you've been a big supporter of the rail system and sometimes it's uncomfortable to support the rail system how do you feel in your district it's been going do you feel like it's it, it, it people are accepting it and excited about it and and what kind of opportunities does it bring I feel that way. You know, rail has been in our community now for many years, um, and we're just starting well, with phase one. Well, a big rail thing. Right. There's no rail oh, right. going. Exactly. Right. Guideways done. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the exciting news is, you know, we're starting phase one of reconstruction for Kamehameha Highway, uh, which is coming from Acacia Road, where the Pro Highland Shopping Center is, to the Hiko Waiao Power Plant, and then phase two will begin next year. So a lot of that is the road repaving for that area, as well as really looking at transit-oriented development. You know, I, I authored and uh, championed, you know, rail legislation, TOD legislation in Waipahu, some of the first TOD zonings that's got improved. And that will really revitalize the community, look at more housing options, whether they be for our kapuna or first-time homeowners or people that are just making ends meet. Um, I know that from looking at your materials, that you, sure. you're, you're not a, opposed to rail. Absolutely not. And I lived in the mainland for five years, so I am a huge fan so of public transportation. So let me though ask, what, what do you, how do you think it's been managed? How do you feel about that? And this is where I go back to private sector, you know, managing a team, managing a budget. I'm highly concerned over the costs, the overruns, the change orders. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that have not been asked. Um, just, you know, simple things like what's the rate schedule? Um, why are we so behind schedule? Uh, where is the funding for the maintenance going to come from? What's the ridership going to look like? You know, when you think about it, the rail is actually going to start in Kapolei, start, dwell, go to Eva. So by the time it gets to us, is there going to be enough room for ridership once it gets to our area of the island. So there's a lot of questions I have. Um, certainly there is, I know, a charter in regards to transparency and having more integration with the heart relations, but there are a lot of outstanding questions and the budget for me is a high concern that I definitely want to get to the bottom of. You know, in our last conversation with uh, the two candidates from the fourth district, sure. they, they seem to have a strong difference over, uh, they, they both say, oh, property taxes shouldn't go to rail, but uh -huh. ultimately, isn't property taxes going to have to go to rail, do you think? 
I, I think I would probably agree with the, the two uh, prior to us. Um, as, as a homeowner, um, I think our property has already gone up organically, so there certainly is, should be a surplus. Um, but no, I'm highly opposed to using property taxes um, for the construction of rail. Um, oh, and just one last comment. I think, you know, speaking with rail um, executives, they have actually been able to make some internal changes to the expense line, so we're actually hopefully don't need the money that we really are being asked for. Just uh, one more question on rail for you, uh, Council. So what what do you see as the biggest, you know, uh, shadow hanging over the project at this point? Well, I think the biggest shadow is really mm. seeing how we finish the minimum operating sentiment, and then look at also spurs that go to UH Manoa that could go to West Kapolei and different areas and different parts of the rail. I look at it as a spine. So it's really how do we get to finishing the minimum operating segment from. Kapolei all the way to Ala Moana Center, how do we do that? And then looking to see how we integrate the transit-oriented developments, which the city council has been having conversations with the administration and as well as the community, uh, and looking at how we can integrate a lot of these different plans that come together that align with our transportation infrastructure. Um, I do have a question from a, a, a viewer, and Wonderful. it's directed at you, uh, Councilman, uh, please comment on your views and voting record in regards to monster homes being built in the neighborhoods. Is that something you see quite a lot of in the in the eighth district? We we do have a few monster homes a in the district, and and what I will say to that is that um, you know the council has an interim moratorium that is in place uh, that looks at these large uh, dwelling units that are in communities. You know, the first thing we see is parking. You know, more people parking, uh, different people coming to the community in these large type of structures. So that interim um, impacts any future building permits for the meantime. But the long-term solution is really looking at the planning commission and proposals that are before them to look at how do we address these type of large dwelling structures in terms of their square feet, um, you know, limitations on certain things. Uh, there's also a current law on unrelated, you know, not supposed to have more than a certain number of unrelated. So it's enforcing that and it's enforcing our current existing codes, but also looking at new tools to look at how do we hamper down on these large structures as well. You mentioned enforcement. Do you think that enforcement has been adequate? Or do you think it's a law problem or a lack of will or lack of resources problem? I think there's there's multiple things involved. And just having conversation with the city's Department of Planning and Permitting, a lot of it is, you know, inspectors. There's also been a huge exodus of people retiring with the wealth of knowledge or even attracting people working in the city's Department of Planning and Permitting. So that's one part of it. The other part is looking at a different set of tools that we can use for enforcement and how do we address that and then in different areas for zoning and whatnot. So we have to look at all those options and really do our best to really serve and protect the community. How do you feel about how yeah. it's been handled so far? Um, there's definitely, yes, it's, it, it is saddened. You know, like Brandon said, our uh, community is very mature. It's multi-generational. Uh, these foreign investors that are coming in and taking advantage of our beautiful communities should be held responsible. Um, there was a current Bill 53. I think you voted in opposition to that. Um, I would have not voted in opposition What's to that. What's Bill 53? Uh, for stricter fines on current monster homes. Um, again, we need to hold them accountable. And yes, there is issues within the you know Department of Planning and Permitting, but uh, you know we, we need to show these developers that are fully taking advantage of the system that they cannot do this to our communities. Do, do you disagree with that concept? So what I will say is, is to um, address the, the no vote on 53 as being explained. What was one of the unintended consequences for my reason for my no vote? Say if you're a homeowner and you construct a fence or something, now there's no sort of leeway in terms of negotiating with the city's Department of Planning and Permitting. So you're stuck with that unintended consequence of that huge fine. Uh, and there's not, you know, being able to, and there is a process that is involved. And so that's one of my main reasons for someone that could be, you know, just a person wanting to improve their property line and whatnot. That's an unintended consequence that they may not be aware about for this. And that's the reason why I voted no on that. Neither of you have mentioned homelessness yet as a major problem in your district, but my perception, and I, pass through the district quite a lot. I, you know, the, use the bikeway at Pearl Harbor, um, oh, and yeah. uh, which is pretty bad. Uh, yeah. um, would you support a ban on homelessness combined with a guaranteed right to housing for all Hawaii residents? Let's use that as a step-off point, and why don't I start with you? Sure. How, 
How do you feel about that? How, how bad is the problem in your district and what kind of things do you think have to happen? Well, it certainly has improved. I mean, I, I, to your point, right? I mean, the bike path, you know, which is goes right through Waipahu, Pearl City, and I uh, was um, a homeless encampment for a while, and it has been recently cleaned up. Um, I guess, like, I, in, in conjunction to that question, I kind of go back to the sit-lie ban, which was passed yesterday. I would be in full support of an island-wide sit-lie ban. I don't think it's fair that there is a sit-lie ban in certain areas of the island, but there's not one for IAO, Pearl City, or Waipahu. I think it needs to be consistent for HPD and to ensure that there's enforcement. But the listener is absolutely right. You know, when we have laws in place, we have to be able to enforce them, but we have to have the services needed to service these mental health issues to the chronically homeless, to the families that are out there. I mean, it's heartbreaking, right? Some families are just paycheck to paycheck away. So there's, I know it's such a complex issue. Um, perhaps I'm not addressing the exact question, but I do support an island-wide sit-lie ban because I don't think our community should be left out. And with all the sweeps, they have gravitated towards our area. I live in um, a suburb area of IAEA, and there is a little homeless community there, if you could imagine. So they use the bathroom and you know they hang their clothes and and, um, you know, at the end of the day, I am just here to protect our keiki, our kupuna, and the safety of our community. You know, uh, you have been one of the uh, pretty consistent in voting against some of the tougher enforcement tactics. Uh, why is that, and what do you see as the solution? Well, what I see as part of the solution of that is something that I looked at four years ago when I first ran is looking at housing first. Housing first is something that has been modeled after certain other cities in the, in the mainland where you look at putting some of our most chronic homeless into housing and stabilizing them so that they get the services and wraparound services and then transition them hopefully back into society. The city has done that with the Navigation Center in San Island as well as um, the Kauiki Village uh, right also off of Nimitz you know where families are I mean, there. There needs to be more of that you know in the district that we represent there's actually no homeless shelter mm -hmm. uh, there may be some transitional ho homes I mean we used to have the Waipaho lighthouse so the nearest one is either in town or out on on, on, the, on the leeward coast so it makes it difficult and what I found is that these people have a face you know and while there may be some that may be in violation of the law and enforcement you know will take its place for them and them being addressed in that way there's some people that you know just are unable to afford just just the cost of everyday living. Let me ask a, a more specific question, something you may be faced with, uh, perhaps you'll be mm -hmm. faced with it if you, if you, if you win. Um, the idea of Ohana zones, the state is preparing to offer money uh, to construct Ohana zones in, or some form of Ohana village type housing. Would you support something like that? You mentioned there's no, nothing in your district. Would you support an Ohana zone in your district? Do you think that would help? I think there has to be more discussion on that and and the reason why I say that is if what comes to mind is Aala Park in town you know where that was kind of sort of a safe zone a safe area and we've seen the ramifications of that and I would have concerns on that I think we have to fully integrate it not so much in that sense but in a way that we can provide and look for property that state or city has in different areas where they're integrated into the community and get the wraparound services whether it be mental or it could be also other types of disorders that they're dealing with, that they really need those programs that we have to provide for more of those resources. How do you feel about the zone idea? And do you feel like, I mean, he just described years of process, housing first and so on, but sure. I mean, do you think things have gotten better? I do not think things have gotten better. However, I am excited that there is a new homeless task force. Um, I am excited for that. I know it's uh, not a short game. It's going to be a long game. Um, but definitely, I think we need to research a little bit more into Ohana zones. Uh, but I would definitely be in favor of collaborating with private sectors or nonprofits and making sure that they're funded to ensure that they do get the services they need from mental health services. And also even just something as simple as transportation. Mm -hmm. So let's just say someone is homeless and is ready and willing to take the help and the shelter and they don't have a right to get there. So providing kind of that city funding to allocate towards making sure that as soon as that person is ready to get on um, board, we are ready to get them to that service. So there's a little bit of a, uh, an opportunity there for us to um, fund. So bo both of you would be uncomfortable if someone said, oh, we're going to put a Ohana zone in. At this moment, in, for in sure. Yeah, there, there definitely needs to be. More there has to be, yeah, yeah, more discussion okay. and collaboration sure. with the community. Okay, so um, a specific, specific question, but we could use this as a springboard for something else, is 
could the candidates talk about paving Waimano Home Road? I don't know much <laughs> about that issue, but you have a lot of roads that are pretty rough Oh my rough goodness, in yeah. Why is that such a big issue? Well, Waimano Home yeah, Road, yeah. It's, it's a corridor that connects to Palisades and right. comes down into Pearl City and Aia, Waipahu, whether you're going east or west. Uh, something we could, you know, take a look at and take a, a look into in terms of what a timeline is for that. It, but it is paved. What, but Como Mai was a huge section going up to Palisades that we pay. So there's certain pockets in the oh, community that we have, whether it's done by seal coating, slurry seal. Okay, so or th this full is what I'm thinking about Springboard. Sure. Is, it, is that the one experience that I have in your guys' district is the traffic is terrible. Oh my gosh, don't get me started. <laughs> well, I'll get you started. I so, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, is there what's going on? What happened in that community that you guys ended up with so many choke points? So many big right. commercial things and such small roads for the most part. I know. Right? Don't get my husband started. He, you know, we as soon as we exit the IA um, off ramp and you get onto Kamehameha mm -hmm. Highway, and now with the stations being built, it goes from four lanes to two lanes. You know, so something that I would have loved to kind of take a study on was, you know, is there a possibility for contraflow? The uh, traffic going eastbound was there an opportunity for contraflow? Um, again, businesses could we have given them some type, some sort of um, exemption um, during the time of construction? Um, but you're absolutely right the traffic and the road conditions are very very frustrating um and, and so go, to go back to Hawaii Mono Home Road no it is a major thoroughfare um I would also add that I would not be in support of it completing or converting into a complete street as well which is something that's, oh, that's another thing yeah but yeah. did you feel that the city has put enough resources into the transportation infrastructure in your district and if not where do you see getting money to do that? Right, not, I would say no, not proactively. I think what we're doing is reactionary. So perhaps, again, going back to that heart and city relationship, you know, when we knew these stations were going to be built, why were we not already proactively having these dialogues and having these conversations on, okay, traffic is going to be from four lanes to two lanes in this massive thoroughfare through IA, which is, again, feeding a ton of businesses, a ton of families getting home after a long day, the proactive approach on what could have been done, and that's the situation that we're in Do you now. feel the same way? Well, we definitely can look at utilizing more of our resources towards that, as I mentioned earlier, about infrastructure and road repaving. And I know uh, in working with the administration uh, in the mayor's first four years, there was a lot of money and allocation towards road, road repaving and infrastructure. So a lot has come to fruition only now that we're seeing, well, certainly we can do more. Do you think though that you have even in your district, even let's say they did repave Cam, Cam Highway and sure. get it all fixed up. I mean, is there enough ways to get cars in and out of your district? It feels like you're in a perpetual state of congestion with or without the rail. Well, there's there's a lot of people that commute through the district, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming, whether they're going home to Evo, Kapole, or somewhere on the west side. And what we have to take into consideration is that we're also a growing population as well. You know, also on the books is Coal Ridge and Ho'opili, and that's going to be having more homes. Uh, and in future plans in, in different areas in different neighborhoods. So a lot of the population has been directed as part of our general plan looking out to the west. And part of that is to protect our rural and country areas. And one sense of relief for that is I, when what, I, when what I believe is our rail system. Um, you know, the rail system providing uh, opportunities for housing development could generate some pretty dense spots along mm -hmm. the railroad. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Are you, you should there be like height limits or anything? Because some of the things they propose in your guys' district is pretty big. Right. right. Yeah, you know, I was kind of sad and I don't know if you're the um, old cam drive-in, if you can imagine, it's just now a sea of cars that are being held there, you know, and so I know there was a urban plan for that area and unfortunately that got nixed. But yeah, there is some major opportunity for us to have some, like you said, vibrant workplace areas. Uh, my concern is I don't think the infrastructure has even been laid down yet. So although we can talk about, you know, all the these amazing projects and housing and pro or different sorts of um, areas, we have to make sure that we have the infrastructure. So if the infrastructure is not there, you know, where's the money going to come from and, you know, how are we going to get there? How big is the problem of, of being able to be ready for this kind of development in your district? Well, part of that is having the continued dialogue and conversations. When I first got into office, we were just talking about the Waipahu transit-oriented development. So the community has been involved over the years to look at ways in terms of height limit, density, what type of mixed uses they would want uh, in the community. Um, there's already um, condos as well as a, a regional shopping center, Pearl Ridge Center, that's already in the heart of the district. So 
it's not new to development in that sense, but nothing has been developed over the years. So we have to cautiously approach that as we move forward. Yet, as, as we look at these um, existing parcels that some of the other landowners may own, you know, private property owners, who may be willing to want to look at revitalization or develop, and some may not be interested at all. Right. You know, in, uh, in in our prior conversation, and we got a question from a viewer that I didn't he didn't have a chance to get to. But as council members, you will be making decisions about the whole island. Of course. Um, yeah. And the question was about Uber and Lyft, which mm -hmm. is very contentious. Sure. Where do you stand on that? Do you feel like the taxi industry needs to be protected from from these? these kinds of companies yeah, or do you, you think actually I have, um, I'm a very hands-on approach um, my managerial style is a very hands-on approach so I actually have met with um, several taxi cab um, companies I've yet to meet with Uber and Lyft but I do use both services um, the one thing that I was shocked to find out was that in 2016 um, the city uh, took away some of the uh, requirements as far as background checks and so it really comes down for me a public safety issue and making sure that the consumer is protected so Although they're two completely separate models, I certainly think we need to protect the local cab companies. Um, but then I also think that Uber and Lyft need to um, kind of step up to the plate and ensure that their drivers are also compliant and ensure that their background checks are up to par and up to standards because they are carrying, you know, local families and, and ensuring that they're getting to their destination safe. So it's about safety and consumer protection. Do, do you think, though, I mean, you, you've been, done, I think you've been on the side of trying to prevent over-regulation of Uber and Lyft mm -hmm. on the council, is that correct? And that is correct, is that, yeah. yeah. And, and part of that is, uh, you know, I do agree mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the consumer putting them at mind, whether they ride a transit network, um, transportation network mm -hmm. company like Uber or Lyft, or if they ride uh, a taxi company. So we need to ensure that, and as part of that is, um, there's been a whole paradigm shift, um, not just here in Hawaii, across the nation, across the world, and how people utilize that first and last mile, whether it be getting to other transportation things, or how do they get from point A to point B. So as a, as, as a city council member, we have to ensure that those safeguards are in place, that we also do regulate. And one, one of my main things that I, I stressed um, to Uber and Lyft is basically the general excise tax. Although the city doesn't require that in a sense, um, they require that to their independent contractors to complete that. And because that they are an operator, an independent contractor, I feel that they should be doing that. But they do provide, you know, great service, and I think it's important to make sure that there's a fair balance with that. Well, we're talking about, you know, uh, web-based services, obviously, right. vacation mm -hmm. rentals. Where do you stand on, on the vacation rentals? How the, the specific question that came up in our last conversation was um, whether you should allow people to rent out their entire home sure. in a residential mm -hmm. area or only allow bed and breakfast mm -hmm. uh, as the mayor has proposed. How do you feel about it? Where do you stand? Yeah, you know, especially coming from the tourism and the hospitality sector, you're right. I mean, the industry has so dynamic. It has changed in the last five to ten years where you, before you used to use a travel agent, right? Now everybody look, books and um, online. So keeping up with those travel trends, home sharing is a very popular way of vacationing and it's more economical. It's popular for sports teams, for family reunions, for weddings. So to completely eliminate it, um, I know we're working with quite um, antiquated, I think, laws from like the 1980s. I certainly think a step forward is looking at some sort of permitting process. Um, leaving residential completely out. Residential is just saved for residents in the framework of our community. But I think there is opportunity for certain uh, popular tourist destinations, um, for example, the North Shore or you know beachfront properties. Uh, there's also technology now. I know the, the ledge was very, very concerned about collecting the TAT. But again, utilizing technology towards our advantage, there's technology and there's components that we can actually partner with and ensure that the homeowner actually pays these taxes electronically um, with a legal permitting system. You know, how do you feel about that position? Well, you know, we do thrive on, on tourism, but we also have to look at and address the resident concerns that mm -hmm. and communities may be experiencing that. Uh, we do need to look at enforcement. We do need to look at areas, you know, um, that could potentially have, you know, maybe open that up as a part of the discussion. The Planning Commission in the last several weeks has held hearings on particular measures relating to TVUs and BNBs and they didn't approve any of that. So now that comes to the council and we have to go through our process and deliberate and have further discussions on, on this issue. Where, where would you, how would you, what's your best idea about a balance? Well, I think a balance is that I know there, there are some that are already here, you know, they're existing in our communities. 
it's making sure that one, you know, if they're operating as 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 a business, that they pay their taxes in that sense, and and that they come into legality and that they are legal. But there has to be some sort of threshold and balance for that. And so, not too many, but you're not against them uh, per se in a residential area. That's what I would say. But I think we also have to really look and look at it island wide, just not in in right. IAO Pro City Wide Pahu. It's an island wide issue. And it's a huge economic driver. I mean, we have to look at the data. I mean, it is a multi billion dollar industry. So, you know, if you know we're looking at re city revenues, right? I mean, we you know need to be creative and open minded, but also be cognizant of our community. So uh, I've only got like 10 seconds yes. each. So give me a 10 second reason that they should elect you. I'll start with you, Ms. Kitshima. Right. Well, I think fundamentally, I think, you know, I respect Brandon. You know, we are very cordial um, to one another, but I just come from such a different background. I come as a mother. I come from a wife. I'm a homeowner um, that pays property taxes that is deathly afraid that it's going to go up and help subsidize rail. And I uh, also have private sector experience that will help perhaps balance okay. budget. Ten Go seconds. ahead. <laughs> really Try to I really love and enjoy yeah. what I do. I think from a very young age, I've been given the gift of service, and I really love and serving my community that I grew up in that spanned multiple generations. Thanks. And to our guests, both of you, it went really fast. And uh, we thank all of you for joining us, too. Thank you, Kelly Kitashima and Council Member Brandon Elefante. Next week on Insights, we have commitments from five of the six candidates for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs at large seats, Leigh Ahu Isa, William Isla Jr., Rowena Akana, Brendan Lee, and John Waihei IV. Join us for a conversation that is sure to be lively. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.